Welcome to this 12th topic, a worldwide reform. And we have 15 topics, now we have 14 topics in total, and I packed it in 15 presentations. And this is now the um, 12th topic, the 13th presentation, and that means that we are done with 80% of this whole series. And in the last presentations, we looked at the kingdom of rebellion that the devil is trying to set up on this world. Through the Antichrist, he's spreading his gospel of lawlessness on this whole world. He's proclaiming it. And I just want to remind you that this lawlessness is referring to back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where Paul is talking about the mystery of lawlessness, the man of lawlessness, the lawless one. And he's referring to Daniel 7 verse 25 with this, where the Antichrist is also described in the symbol of a little horn. And there it says that uh, this little horn, the Antichrist, is, is about to change times and law. And this law is not the Babylonian law or so, it's the law of God. So the lawlessness at the end of time that is spreading over the whole world, compare Matthew 24, um, I think it's verse 12, where Jesus says the lawlessness will abound. It's not a, ah, let us get rid of the law of God. We don't need Jesus. We don't need his law. It is a change of the law. It's a change. And that is why it is a deception. Okay, it's not a complete throwing away of the law. It's a change. And that is what Daniel 7 verse 25 is talking about. That's what we saw in the last presentations. The Roman Catholic Church boasting in this that she changed God's law by um, putting the, the Sabbath from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week to the Sunday. The mark of her authority. And with this presentation now, but you know, that's what the devil is doing in order to establish his kingdom of rebellion on this earth. But God is not silent. We know from Matthew 24 that also God will proclaim his gospel on this world, right? So in the last three presentations, we will talk about God's gospel that he is proclaiming at the end of the world or his message. Let me say it that way. That's better. And his kingdom that he will establish. So second original. In the book of Revelation, we have this, this uh, so-called dualism. So we have a fake church and a true church. The fake church is the harlot Babylon, Revelation 17. That is the, the fake, the counterfeit to the pure woman in Revelation 12. We have a fake Christ, that is the beast, the Antichrist, and we have the true Christ, Jesus Christ. We have a fake kingdom or a fake city, that is the kingdom of Babylon, the city of Babylon. That is a counterfeit, a, a counter player, a counter city, a counter kingdom to the new Jerusalem in Revelation 21. Now the way the woman, the harlot in Revelation 17 is clothed in scarlet and purple and in, in gold and linen. If you would look up all these materials, <clears throat> the only passage where you find them all together is in the clothings of the priests. In, in um, the law of Moses. With one exception, the priests, they have also blue in their clothings, but the woman has no blue. And I think there is a reason why she does not have. And um, there is one, um, one part in this, this whole, I don't, I don't know how to <laughs> express that in, in English, um, of the whole clothing that the priest has. There is one thing that is blue, blue only blue. And... This is according to the law of Moses to remind him of the law of God. Now, the harlot is the one that changed God's law, right? And that put her own law in the place, her own changed version of God's law in the place of God's real law. So he, she has a problem with the law, right? With the law of God. So maybe that's the reason why she doesn't have blue in her clothing. But the point is, it's a counterfeit priesthood. Priesthood. And that stands in, in contrast to Jesus being the high priest. And I mean, we know that the Roman Catholic Church is a, set up a counterfeit priesthood because she has a priesthood. And Catholics are told to go to the priest as a mediator and to ask him to confess him this, her, their sins. And then she's, he says to them, your sins are forgiven. Whereas the Bible says we shall, Christ is our mediator, we shall go to him and confess our sins to him and then the sins will, for, will be forgiven. And that is also included in this, in this false priesthood. Okay. 
so it's a fake priesthood. And then we have the beast from the earth, that is a counterfeit Holy Spirit. It brings the whole world to worshipping the Antichrist instead of the true Christ. And it lets fire come down from heaven, a fake Pentecost in contrast to the true Pentecost that is about to come, Joel 2. And we also saw that uh, this when we talked about the NAR, the New Apostolic Reformation, that is slowly uh, you know, forming their rows and spreading, that they understand themselves as the last Elijah that has come to restore, to, to prepare the world for the coming millennium. But we saw that it is a false Elijah. And there is also a true Elijah to come, Malachi 4 verse 5. And in this topic, and the mark of the beast, sorry, the mark of the beast, seal of God issue. Okay, fourth Sunday, keeping in the, the mark, the sign of the authority of the Antichrist of the Roman Catholic Church, in contrast to the, the sign of authority that God is the creator, God is the redeemer, that God is the author of everything, and has authority over everything, the Sabbath being the seal of that, the sign of that. Now, in this topic, we want to talk about the false Elijah and the mark of the beast seal of God thing. So, we want to talk about the true Elijah and the seal of God, the last Elijah. Now, this is not talking about, and I want to say this right at the beginning, um, of Elijah as a person, because that is a misconception that the Jews themselves had. They asked John the Baptist, are you the Elijah? Now, we know from Jesus, Jesus said that John was the Elijah to come, right? And now the Jews come to John and ask him, are you the Elijah? And John says, no, I'm not. How can we explain that? Now, the point obviously is that the Jews thought that John was the Elijah coming down from heaven in person. And John said, no, that's not what I am. Whereas Jesus is referring to John as someone that came in, in the spirit of Elijah, in the ministry of Elijah, in the mission of Elijah. And that is what the angel Gabriel said to Zacharias in Luke 1.17, that John would come in the spirit of Elijah and will perform a, way of, a work of restoration like Elijah did in ancient times. So, likewise here, the last Elijah, it's not an Elijah that is coming down, Elijah coming in person here. It's a person or a group that is bringing reform over this world in the spirit of Elijah, in the ministry of Elijah, in the mission of Elijah. Malachi 4. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And I want to remind you, the great and dreadful day of the Lord is the great and dreadful day of his wrath. Okay, that's why this, this day is called like this, when God will judge the world. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So it is a work of restoration that is to be, for, to be performed. And the text I refer to, Luke 1, 13. There, this is the angel Gabriel talking to Zacharias. Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall neither drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. There it is. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So here again, you have this work of reformation, of restoration, to prepare a people for the Lord when he comes. So that was true for John the Baptist when Jesus came to this earth the first time. And it is true for the, the second Elijah, or basically it's the third Elijah, the last Elijah for Jesus' second time, second coming to this earth. He is to prepare a people for God. For Jesus Christ's coming. And if we look into Christianity, is there a work of preparation to be done? I would say absolutely. So before God, before Jesus Christ comes, God's people has to be prepared, reformed. Now it says of, of John the Baptist in Mark 1, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I sent my messenger. This is talking now about John. 
Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths, his paths straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So repentance, here is a note and says, immersion in the water as a sign of the change of mind. So immersion in the water, that means not just sprinkling with water, okay? That means, you know, like Paul says in Romans 6, we are dying, we are buried in the water like Jesus was buried in the soil. So it's a really completely going under the water and coming up again. Okay, just as a side note. <clears throat> Now, he was to prepare the ways, and this does not mean to clean the roads, roads, exact, okay? That's not what this text is talking about. It talks about an inner preparation. I think that's obvious. An inner preparation that is to take place. And his disciples asked him, now, um, this text happened after the transfiguration of Jesus. On, the, on, the, on this mount where he had John, James, and Peter with him. And when Jesus prayed and they were sleeping, then all of a sudden there were Elijah and Moses um, standing next to Jesus and talking with him. And after this, his disciples asked Jesus the following. Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And Jesus answered and said to them, indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. So it's still future. Okay, Jesus, so there is another Elijah yet to come. But I say to you that Elijah has come already, and they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke of them of John the Baptist. Now the great mistake of the Jews was that they did not receive John the Baptist. They did not receive his message, and thereby they were not prepared for the coming of Jesus. Their hearts were not prepared. And they could not receive the message of Jesus. They could not understand his message, his, his mission. Because they had a false understanding of Elijah, of the things that would come. So we shouldn't repeat the mistakes, the, the error of the Jews. We must have a clear and right understanding of the Elijah that is to come. Now there is a false Elijah to come as well okay that's what we have to to have in mind so we must be able to distinguish lest we follow the the false elijah instead of the true elijah or lest we miss the true elijah so we can and we can reject both of them you know that's also a bad thing we must receive the true elijah so we need to have a, a correct understanding of the true elijah now here's one more time, this, this quote that we had when we were talking about this, the, the fire from heaven, <clears throat> the, the New Apostolic Reformation. Rick Joyner, according to their own prophets, now this is from an article, according to their own prophets, this army is destined to bring about a global revolution called the Elijah Revolution. Rick Joyner, a major prophet of the NAR, this is the New Apostolic Reformation, has predicted a veritable revolution that will be carried out by a great company of prophets, teachers, pastors, apostles that will be of the spirit of Pinhas. Now, Pinhas was a priest in the Old Testament who turned the wrath of God away from God's people by executing the death penalty upon the most obstinate fornicator in the camp. So, I mean, this is a quite interesting picture here. I don't want to go into this anymore, but there is this, this false Elijah that is, that is preparing to, to run over this world. And we need to understand these things. Who is Elijah? What is his mission? What is his message? So that we do not repeat the history of the Jews. Because, you know, and I'm repeating myself here, the Jews, they, they couldn't receive John because they had a false conception of this, of his ministry, of the Elijah. And they had a false understanding of the time they were living in. And because they didn't receive John, they didn't receive him that was to prepare them so that they could re receive the Messiah, so they could not receive Jesus. And they finally chose Barabbas instead of Jesus. And this world will, do, will, will walk exactly the same path. Christianity will walk down exactly the same path. They, at the end, will choose the Antichrist 
so to say, Barabbas instead of Jesus. Because they are not prepared for the coming of the Lord. Now, the mission of Elijah. The mission of Elijah was to call for repentance. We see this in John the Baptist. His message was, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The mission of Elijah is also a call for making a choice. You see this in 1 Kings 18 verse 21, where Elijah is there at Mount Carmel and he is calling the, the Jews to make a decision. He says, how long will you falter between two opinions? Is Baal Lord? Then follow him wholeheartedly. Is God Lord? Then follow him wholeheartedly. Don't try to mix things up to have half Baal, half the Lord. Make a decision. The Lord or Baal. So where do we find such a message for the end times? A message, a call for repentance and a call for making a choice. And I think we find this message or this, this type of message in the so-called three messages of the angels in Revelation 14. We read from verse 6, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead, or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So here you clearly see this call for making a decision, for making a choice. And this is the Elijah message for the end time. The call, man to call, the call for man to repentance and to prepare for the Lord's coming. So we are going to have a look now at these three messages of the angels. We know from Matthew 24 verse 14 that the gospel is to be pre preached on the whole world. It reads, and the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. And so the gospel preached on all the worlds, the whole world. And this is basically fulfilled in Revelation 14, verse 6, when it says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. So this is really all the world, saying with a loud voice. Okay, and now comes the three angels' message. So this is the everlasting gospel preached on the whole world, like Matthew 24, 14 says. So this three angels message is a fulfillment of Matthew 24 verse 14. The world is prepared for Jesus coming. Now if that's what Revelation 1, um, I think verse 7 says that every eye will see Jesus when he returns. Every eye. Okay, that's, there is no secret return of the Lord. Every eye will see him. Now if every eye will see him, then every ear must heard of him. And then every heart must have been prepared. That doesn't mean that everyone receives Jesus, but that means that every heart has made a decision, either for him or against him. Everyone has made its choice, okay? Not all are believers, okay? The majority will, make it, will have made a choice, a choice that says no to Jesus and his message. Now, what is the context of this 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 message. It's chapter 14, so we have Revelation 12 before it. And there it says in verse 17 that the dragon makes war with those that have the spirit of prophecy and that keep the commandments of God. Now, how 
is the devil making war with, um, with this group. And it is described in Revelation 13 and 17. It's through the Antichrist, okay, through sending his apostle, so to say, the Antichrist. Um, in Revelation 13, the Antichrist and the dragon, we see these two together. We have the loyalty, the obedience of mankind to the beast. They worship the image and they receive the mark, that is this, this Sunday law. They will finally show loyalty to this um, law that will go out to keep Sunday. So that's the context. You have the Antichrist working, deceiving the whole world, drawing the whole world into his, his lawlessness. That is this mark of the beast, Sunday law issue. And there comes Revelation 14. That's important that we have that context. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him. For the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. Give glory to God and worship Him, not the Antichrist. That's the call. Worship the Creator. This is something that the devil cannot claim. The devil cannot give life. He cannot give life. Only God can give life. Okay, that is important. Now, what does it mean to fear God? And by the way, it says here, made the heavens and the earth and the sea. And these three you find in the Sabbath commandment. Here is added the fountains of waters. And uh, if I um, didn't make a mistake here, that's the only place where you find this, this added, the fountains of waters. And for those of you that are interested in this whole thing, uh, I would be interested in, a, in an answer. Why is there the fountains of water? There must be a reason for that. Okay, and maybe you can figure it out. Okay, back to topic. What does it mean to fear God? Because that's the call. Fear God and give glory to Him. But what does that mean? Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil, that is understanding. Okay, we could say fear God is to depart from evil. Okay. Let us go on. Proverbs 1 verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. So the fear of the Lord is also somehow, you know, linked to wisdom and instruction. Fearing God means to recognize God's superiority and rule. An awareness that God sees me and whatever I do, I will be held accountable for evil deeds. Leviticus 19.4 and so on. I think we'll read them now. Yes. You shall not curse the thief, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but shall fear your God, I am the Lord. So there you see that um, this awareness that God is seeing me and nothing, nothing what I do is hidden from him. And I will be held accountable for my deeds, that I have this in my mind. Therefore you shall not oppress one another, but you shall fear your God. For I am the Lord your God. Take no usury or interest from him, but fear your God that your brother may live with you. In mercy and truth, atonement is provided for iniquity, and by the fear of the Lord one departs from evil. So fearing God again is an awareness that God sees me in whatever I do. I will be held accountable for my evil deeds. The second point is respect for God's will and observance of his commandments. And we read here, Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep all my commandments, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. And Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 6, this is directly after the Ten Commandments, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you to, commanded you, you and your son and your grandson all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. And one more text, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Now, this is a typical 
Hebrew parallelism, okay? The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold. So here you have law, testimony, statutes, commandments in one row with fear of the Lord. So fearing God is is means to keep his commandments. One more text, Ecclesiastes 12. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. So, so to say, let us hear the conclusion, the sum of all teaching. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. This text is basically summing up this whole thing. Okay, that I um, brought up so that the awareness that God sees me and everything that I do and that I'm therefore keeping his commandments. So fear God means to submit to God, to walk in his ways with all your heart, keep his commandments. Is this surprising to us? That this fear God, this call to, to submit to God's will, to keep his commandments, is this surprising for us? No, because that's the context of this great controversy that is, that is described in the book of Revelation, right? Mark of this beast or keeping the commandments of God. That's the choice that mankind has to make. And there is this call coming, fear God and give glory to him. Don't follow the commandments of man, follow the commandments of God. That's the call. And then it's the second angel's message coming, verse 8. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, I don't want to go into the second angel's message here. It's, it's actually a description of something that happened. It's not a, a call that is included in here, so I want to leave it out here. Um, instead, I want to go to the third angel's message. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here is the steadfastness of the saints. Here are those that stand fast despite all the deception, all the pressure that is going on. Okay, that will be the proper translation instead of patience. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, this is the most terrible message in the whole Bible that has ever been proclaimed to mankind. So, this thing about keeping the having the mark of the beast or keeping god's commandments is not a light thing for god but it's a very grave thing for him with devastating consequences devastating consequences and therefore a warning is needed the call for mankind to make a wise choice whom do you like to follow whose authority you like to bow to to the authority of the beast then choose the mark of the beast if not, follow God, keep his commandments. This is this call like Elijah made at the Mount Carmel. Make a choice. Make a choice. So and this brings me to the next section of this presentation, and that is the seal of God. And we start with Revelation 7. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, and the wind should not blow, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. So this is talking about this last great storm that is to come over the world. Now, winds 
<clears throat> are a symbol in Bible prophecy. I will not prove it to you right now, but they are a symbol for war and destruction. And here are the four angels that are holding back the four winds that are to blow on the earth, that are bringing a time of destruction on this earth that has never been witnessed before. Which is the great time of tribulation. We will see this in a moment. But they are advised to not let these four winds go until the faithful ones receive the seal on their forehead. And that is the seal of God. Verse 3. Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed. 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Now, some text to this great tribulation. For then there will be a great tribulation, such has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. This is Matthew 24. And also in Daniel 12, we read, At that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book in brackets of life. The great time of the great tribulation. God's spirit holds the forces of evil in check. But after the faithful believers that keep the commandments of God receive the seal of God, and after the unfaithful believers and the unbelievers receive the mark of the beast, that means till all men have made a choice, then God's spirit withdraws from the earth. And then the devil, that is a murderer from the beginning, can work unhindered. I mean, Jesus says the devil is a murderer from the beginning. And the reason why we do not see way more people dying and being killed and way more catastrophes and all these things going on is because God's spirit, God's spirit and the angels are holding the forces of evil back. But this holding back will be taken away, so to say, when everyone has made its choice. And then the seven last plagues will also fall. Uh, this is um, the so-called ends of grace. The time of probation will close. Okay. Then the great tribulation will come when everyone, everyone has made his choice. And the believers will receive the seal of God first. Now the seal of God has its type in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 9. There it says, Now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the, from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple. And he calls to the man clothed with the linen who had the writer's inkhorn at his side. And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the man who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. So he says, Go through the city and search for those that are faithful to my cause, and to them give a sign on their foreheads. To the others, he said in my hearing, go after him through the city and kill. Do not let your eyes spare, nor have any pity. Utterly slay old and young men, maidens and little children and women. But do not come near anyone on whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were before the temple. Now the context is the abominations in Israel. And that is idol worship <clears throat> in Israel. And it is that um, Ezekiel is first brought to Jerusalem and he sees there an image of an idol. And then God says to him, you see that image of an idol? I will show you even greater abominations in that city. And then he is brought to the door of the court. And then he sees there them worshipping all kinds of creeping things. And then God says, I will show you even greater abominations. And then he's brought within the inner court. So it gets more and more closer to the, to the holy place. And in the inner court, he sees the women weeping for Tammuz. And God says, you see them weeping for Tammuz? But I will show you even greater abominations. 
And then he is brought to the entrance of the tem temple. And there he sees the elders, so the leaders, worshipping the sun. And that is the greatest abomination. That is where the star reaches its peak. That is the greatest abomination for God. That the sun is worshipped. And there are some interesting uh, parallels in this because he's finally at the temple. And we know that the Antichrist will sit down in the temple at the end of time. With his lawlessness, he will you know, establish his, his lawlessness, his gospel of lawlessness in the temple. Um, and you have the sun worship. And we know that the mark of the beast is linked to Sunday. So, and the Sunday is a, uh, how is it, how, um, one of the, the, one remnants of this whole Sunday worship, sun worship tradition that we have, um, or the ancient had. It's relic or something like that. I don't know if this is the right word. Now, of course, here the mark is not literal, okay? It's not about a literal sign that, uh, the angel went through before um, the destruction of Jerusalem through the Babylonians. He went through and made a cross or something like this on everyone's forehead that was faithful. It is a, a symbol, okay? A symbol that it stands for the attitude that those people had. Now that is faithfulness to God's cause, to God's commandments. Um, and likewise, it is in Revelation. It is a symbol that is showing the attitude that his people, the faithful ones, have they are taking in regard to God's commandments. So we go back to Revelation 7, where it talked about the seal of God. Now we will not um, read it again. I want to go to verse 4, where it says, And I heard the number of those who were sealed. 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Now this is a symbolic number, because there is over and over again, this question, is it a literal number? Is it a symbolic number? And of course, it's a symbolic number. Because if you look at the listing of the tribes, now it says of all the tribes of Israel, and then the, the 12 tribes are listed. But if you look at the, the 12 tribes they are, that are listed, this doesn't make any sense. Because these are not the 12 tribes of Israel as they are actually numbered, listed. Because the, the tribe of Dan is missing, and instead, there is Joseph counted double because Joseph is listed and also Manasseh, his son, is listed. And actually you have either the listing without Levi, then there's also no Joseph in it. But then there is the two sons of Joseph in it, so that it's 12 again. Or you have Levi, but then there's only Joseph and not and Manasseh and um, if Ephraim are excluded. But here you have everything mixed up and mixed through. So this is not an accurate listing. And that shows us that this um, is a symbol. It stands for something. And I don't know what it is. Maybe it's, you, could, you should investigate the meaning of the names and there you can get a message out of it. I don't know exactly. Um, you can compare it, by the way, to, with Genesis uh, 35, verse 25 and following, and Genesis 49, verse 1 to 27. There you have this, that the tribes listed. And after the listing of these tribes, it continues describing these, these 144,000. Verse 9, After these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. And by the way, here you should see, it's all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. It's not about Israel. It's not about Jews. Okay, it's a symbol. It's made of all people from all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. And why that? Because the three angels' message goes out to every tribe, nation, tongue, and whatsoever. And these people were reached by that message. And they accepted that message. And they said, we want to stay faithful to God's commandments, that including the Sabbath commandment. <clears throat> so they took their stand on God's side. And this is this group. Now this group is further characterized. We will see this in a moment as those that come out of the Great Tribulation. Now, we know that there will be persecution against those that will not receive the mark of the beast, but the seal of God, and it says that they ultimately will be killed. So many of the faithful ones that took their stand on God's side will be killed. But these 144,000 is a very specific group in this faithful ones that is still living when Jesus Christ is returning. That is important to understand. Okay, back to the text. It says, 
So this group is standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation, and wash their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So here you see, they, they come from this tribulation. They survived all the persecution. And they are living when Jesus Christ returns. This is the 144,000. And they have the seal of God. Now, the seal of God has to do with, with the Sabbath, okay? Because it's the, the contrast to the mark of the beast and the mark of the beast is contrasted by those that keep the commandments of God. And since the sign of authority, the sign of the Roman Catholic Church, according to their own words, is the Sunday. So the, the sign of the Antichrist, the Sunday, then the, the sign of the Christ is the Sabbath. And we know this. Now, this, this Sunday Sabbath debate, here we have a text from Pope John Paul II. I want to read it to you. He says in Dios Domini, It was for this reason that from apostolic times, the first day after the Sabbath, the first day of the week, began to shape the rhythm of life for, Christian, for Christ's disciples. The first day after the Sabbath was also the day upon which the faithful of Troas were gathered for breaking of bread, when Paul bade them farewell and miraculously restored the young Eutychus to life. The book of Revelation gives evidence of the practice of calling the first day of the week the Lord's Day. This would now be a characteristic distinguishing Christians from the world around them. Now he says, there are some questions in my mind or things that we have to have a look at when we read this. The first is he speaks of a habit, a rhythm, a weekly habit, that Sunday was already a weekly habit for the Christians in the New Testament. He says the Lord's Day is describing Sunday. John means Sunday with this. And we will see if that is really the case. And he says it's a distinguishing sign. It distinguished the Christian from all the world around that. And we already saw, saw that this is not the case. In fact, yeah, it was. <clears throat> Sunday was chosen, in fact, to distinguish. But it was chosen to distinguish the Christians from the Jews. And to, you know, make them a little bit... Bring them a bit more closer to the heathens that were also embracing Sunday. So... Yeah, I don't have to go into this, but you probably have it in your mind still. So we will have a look at the three texts that he's bringing up. And we ask ourselves, is it really correct what he's deriving from these texts? But before we do that, I want to establish a principle. And this principle is the principle of two or three witnesses. In Matthew 18... Jesus says, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And this is a very good advice that we too solemnly mm, take heed to in our church. Okay, when there is, so that means when a brother is doing something against me, I am to go to him and clarify it with him. I'm not to tell it to, you know, the half of the church. This is between me and him. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And in 2 Corinthians 13, Paul writes to the Corinthians, This will be the third time I am coming to you. And then he quotes, By the mouth of two or three witnesses every word shall be established. And also, if you look at Jesus, he also uses this principle. Now, we saw it here in Matthew 18, but... For example, when he was confronted, um, out of what testimony, what witness are you giving that you may do these things? And then he says, well, my father bears witness of me, my works bear witness of me, and the scriptures bear witness of me. I mean, what is Jesus doing here? He's bringing three witnesses. He's relying, he's... he's, he's Referring to the, to the very same principle that he self-established in the Old Testament. And that is um, confirmed in the New Testament. So that's 
this this principle of two or three witnesses upon the, wit the the testimony of two or three clear witnesses that is important a thing shall be established it shall be considered true <clears throat> and there is another thing that i want to bring up and there is two questions when reading a text if biblical texts are to be consulted to answer a certain question it is very helpful to address two essential questions to the respective text passage the first that is the obvious one what does the text say but there is a second question that is also very important, and that is, what does the text not say? And this question is also important. It sometimes is very helpful to make this counter question. Okay. Now, with this knowledge, let us go to Revelation 1, to the first text. And here John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. So, here... The Pope says, here we see that John calls the Sunday the Lord's Day. Okay, let us bring up our two questions. The first question, what does the text say? Now, the text says the Lord's Day. What does the text not say? The text does not say which day is meant. I mean, you would probably say, yeah, I mean, come on, but uh, it's clear. Is it clear? I mean, where is it clear? Yes, in later Christianity, in the 2nd century and 3rd century, the Sunday is called that way, the Lord's Day. But, and that is basically important, if we look to John 20 verse 1 and John 20 verse 19, we find the following. This is also John writing, and he's writing approximately at the same time. In fact, there is good reason to assume, and I know many theologians do so, and I would absolutely agree on that, that John first wrote the book of Revelation, and after he wrote the, his gospel and the letters. And for example, I can just name it here. The, what is very, very um, singular for, for the book of, for John's, John writes, John's writings is that he emphasizes so much the keeping of the commandments. Okay, I don't have the text in here, but if you read John 15 and 14 and 15, there Jesus is three times saying, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And in his letters, Jesus is, uh, John is again and again saying, if we love God, we will keep his commandments. He's saying this, I don't know, three or four times. And the question must be, why is John so much emphasizing this issue of keeping the commandments of God? Whereas you don't find this in the letters of Paul and James and, you know, and all this. You don't find it in the other Gospels. Why is he emphasizing it so much? And my answer is it because he knows from the book of Revelation that keeping God's commandments is a great issue at the end of time, is in fact the great marking point, the great distinguishing point. And that is why he's stressing this point so much in his, in his gospel. Okay, so he wrote it, the gospels and his letters after the book of Revelation. And now it's interesting that he says in John 20, verse 1, now the first day of the week, when Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and in 19, then the same day at the evening being the first day of the week. So here John still calls the Sunday the first day of the week. Now, if what the Pope said is true, that it was already a custom for John and the Christians back then to call the Sunday the first day of the week, the, the, the Lord's Day, why is John, after the book of Revelation is written, calling the Sunday, the first day of the week. So this shows that the Sunday, it was not a custom to call the Sunday the, the Lord's Day. And this leaves the question unanswered, what is John talking about here, the Lord's Day? What day is it? And in fact, if we say we apply, we, you know, if we say sola scriptura is the principle we cling to, then we have to interpret that text in the light of the Bible. And this would bring us to texts like Isaiah 58. Now, what is the day, the Lord's day? What is the day that belongs to the Lord? If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, what is the day of the Lord? It's the Sabbath. And call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. And you could also bring in this 
Mark 2, where Jesus said, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And there Jesus says, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath belongs to me. It's my day. And I can, I know how this day shall be, you know, uh, celebrated. Okay. So, if we say Sola Scriptura, the Lord's Day would be the Sabbath rather than the Sunday. Okay. We go to the next text. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 to 2. Now concerning the collection of this for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So from this text, Paul the, the, the Pope says, here we see that there was a rhythm in the Christian uh, churches. So there was a collection here going on. So we obviously are dealing here with church service. And that means, okay, here you see the Christians, they had a church gathering at Sunday and they were collecting money. Is that what this text says? Now, what does this text not say? This text is not speaking of a collection during a church service. Instead, this text is speaking that everyone should lay in store by him. That means at his home. It's not about the church service. It's about laying in store at your home by yourself. So putting money aside on Sunday. So here Sunday isn't in the picture. That's true. We are talking, we're dealing here with Sunday. But it's about putting money aside in my home on Sunday. That's what this text is talking about. It's not about the church gathering. Okay, that's here we are, and this is a classical example for, you know, reading our situation into the text. Now we have church service on Sunday and we are collecting money on Sunday, so they probably did it too, but they did not. Now they collected money on Sunday, but without the church service, okay? So what does this text actually say? The text says that right at the beginning of the week, every Christian should put money aside and store it at his home. Weekly wages were paid on Friday evening and on the Sabbath, according to the Jewish example, no monetary matters should be done. Therefore, Sunday was the first possible opportunity to lay aside an amount of money appropriate for the, to the circumstances. Finally, when Paul would come, the individual collections should be combined to form a total church collection. So, if this text is saying something in regard to this Sunday Sabbath issue, it would be a text in favor of Sabbath because that's the day where they wouldn't have anything to do with uh, money issues. They received their salary on Friday evening and they were not to, you know, think on Sabbath and calculate how much of it can I, I lay aside, how much of it do I need. And so these things they should avoid doing. So they should do such um, on the first day possible and that has been the Sunday. So it rather is a text for Sabbath rest than for Sunday. And basically there's also a lesson for the tithe in it. Um, because the principle is at the beginning when you receive your money, you lay aside how much of it shall uh, you want to give to God. Not of the rest that you have available. Okay, and that means if we get our salary monthly and I don't know, at the beginning of the month, in the middle, at the end, we directly, when we receive the money, we put away the tithe. Okay, so we don't touch this money. It it's belongs to the Lord. Okay, we go to the next text, Acts 20. Now, this is probably the most popular text um, for proving Sunday worship in the New Testament. And we read it. Now, on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread. Now, I want to say here already, breaking bread is a very difficult it's difficult to determine what it means in the new testament because you find this this expression very often with jesus but jesus he was breaking the bread for the four thousand for the five thousand and so on and so forth they did not celebrate um the lord's supper here okay this is breaking bread means you break the bread and this can be for a meal but this can also be for the lord's supper and it's and likewise it's here it's not clear uh, what it means here we unfortunately don't know that's simply how it is so <clears throat> disciples came together to break pads bread paul ready to depart the next day spoke to them and continued his message until midnight 
There were many lamps in the upper room uh, where they were gathered together, and in the window sat a certain young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep, and as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down, fell on him, and embraced him, said, Do not trouble yourselves, for his life is in him. Now when he had come up, <clears throat> had, sp <clears throat> had broken bread and eaten, and talked a long while, even till daybreak, he departed. And they brought the young man in alive, and they were not little comforted. The first question would be, <clears throat> when is this meeting taking place? Or, or when is this... Um, taking place, what is taking place here, that Paul speaks till midnight and then this young man is falling down and so on and so forth. It says the first day of the week. Now, this could be Sunday evening, because we are in evening, obviously, here, or it could be Saturday evening. And it depends on the time reckoning. Um, I don't have the time to prove it to you. Um, I, th I know in German there is a... A sermon where someone is dealing with this and he shows it that Luke is Luke's time reckoning is, is Jewish so he thinks in Jewish terms of time and that means that the day begins with the evening I don't know if this is probably this is also available somewhere in, in English if I find it I will put it in the description I don't know till now so that means if Jew if uh, if we are at evening and if Luke is what he does <clears throat> is, is thinking in Jewish time that means we are at Saturday evening here and what is happening? They are breaking bread. Now, as I said, this can be a meal, normal meal. This can be the Lord's Supper. But also is the question the Lord's Supper on a regular basis or was it a singular event because Paul was there and they were celebrating supper with him, Lord's Supper with him. This also is not clear. Okay, And we cannot clarify it because the text just is as it is. Um, so, when is it taking place? It's taking place at Saturday evening. And the, the historical context is that Paul and Luke, they were for seven days in Troas. And this is the last day of their stay at Troas. And they had a, a gathering at Saturday evening because, you know, Paul was to leave and they certainly stayed and said a farewell and had a special feast and a special gathering there. Um, and... Paul has much to say. And so this evening gathering becomes a night gathering. And it becomes so late that this young man is falling down from out of the window and he is dying. Um, but Paul brings him back to life. Now the next morning, already at dawn, so when the sun is rising up, so at this, when it's getting bright, Paul departs. That's, that's what is happening here. So... Let us ask the question, what does the text say? The Christians were gathered, gathered at Sunday, namely Saturday evening. Okay, the sun set down and the Sunday started according to biblical um, time reckoning. What does the text not say? And this is now important. That it was a regular Sunday celebration. We cannot say this from this text. Um, it... It appears more like it was a unique event because it was Paul's farewell. And we don't also, the text also does not say that there was a regular Lord's Supper, supper on Saturday, that means on uh, Saturday evening. This, we, can, we can also not prove from that text. Now, the important question is, and this is really important, when did the gathering begin? I mean, we are, we are here Saturday evening when this, this, this story with Paul starts. And we, we do not see this in German and English language, but we, we have, um, when we look into the Greek, there is something in there that we do not realize in German and English. It says here, now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. There were many lambs in the upper room where they were gathered together. On Saturday evening, Paul begins his conversation with the disciples. This is the point of reference in regards to time. It is said that the disciples were gathered at this point. The verb synago used here is in the perfect tense. 
This describes an action that has started prior to the point of reference and lasts until it. I think in English you, you have this with, um, I don't know exactly if you can, with the perfect tense and um, if we say we have eaten when, Jesus, when James comes. When James comes we have eaten. I think if you can make a construction like this, but then it would be clear for everyone that we did not start eating when, G when James comes, but prior to that. And the same is here. Um, you can, I have an illustration here, although the English is not correct, um, but I think the principle becomes clear. And when it says, on Sunday afternoon when we were playing soccer, my brother came and joined. And what the Greek is telling us that here is the point when the Sunday afternoon when the brother comes and joins, but the playing of soccer begins without the brother prior to that. And that is the dynamic here. This is the, how this, this verb, what this verb means, and the, the tense that this verb uh, in the, um, that is used for this verb. And you have other examples in the New Testament, for example, John 20, 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled. Here you have this, this tense. For fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. So this is the same dynamic here. And... It's clear from that this, they were assembled. This is this perfect tense. And this shows us that they were assembled. And then, uh, well, let me say the other way. When Jesus appeared in their midst, the disciples have already been gathered together for a few hours prior to that. And then Jesus comes in their midst. So the gathering started before Jesus came to them. Here on the same day, the day of the resurrection, signed the disciples had gathered and hid. When, when evening came, that is Monday, had begun and they were still gathered together, Jesus appeared in their midst. And here also in Acts 4.23, And being let go, they went to their own companions. Okay, this is Peter and John. They were um, beaten because they preached Jesus, although they were um, not allowed to. And they returned to their companions who were who were apparently gathered probably for prayer and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voices to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and sea and all that is in them. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. And here is, again, where this, they were assembled together, was shaken. Um, this, this, obviously, this shaking happened a good while after they started to be assembled. And this is, again, what this, test, this, this tense here indicates. So a translation that would um, consider this, would, I have your proposal, would sound maybe like this. Now, on the first day of the week, that is Saturday evening, when the disciples were still gathered together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. So, summing up, Paul continues his speech until midnight because he apparently already at the beginning of his stay had set his mind to leave at sunrise on Sunday morning, sometimes strict schedule in his missionary trips. Okay. Why leaving Sunday morning, not Sunday noon? He obviously wants to keep the Sabbath rest, have a night's sleep, and then leave at the earliest opportunity. Paul does, not, Paul does not celebrate a Sunday morning service either, but goes on a long journey. Unlike his companions, he decides to make the way to Assos on foot, an undertaking that took him more than 10 hours to walk. Thus, it can be seen that Sunday was not a day of rest for Paul or, and his companions, but an ordinary working day. <clears throat> so what does the text say? The gathering of the disciples had already started sometime before the conversation with Paul. That is before Saturday evening. And that is means sometimes on Saturday, Sabbath. The text does not speak of a Sunday service. Instead, it appears that the church spent the Sabbath together as the church's Sabbath program eventually ended in the evening, Paul takes the floor to offer a few last words of encouragement and admonition and to be available to answer questions. Paul's travel venture reveals Sunday as a working day. So much to this text. So it is a text basically 
correctly read and understood that proves Sabbath rest, but certainly not Sunday rest. Now I want to lose some words in regards to the Sabbath. In Exodus 20 verses 8 to 11, in the Ten Commandments it says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So we have, here we have the direct reference to the end of the creation story. The God created in seven and six days God created the heavens and the earth and he rested on the seventh day. So it reads in Genesis 2, Thus the heavens and the earth and the, all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. So we are to follow the example of, of God. Okay? It said in the commandment, you shall do all your work six days and the seventh day you shall rest. And here it says, God did all his work and on the seventh day he rested. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. There are several things happening here. The first is that God blesses this day. So there is a special blessing on that day and only on this day. And that is important. The seventh day is blessed and no other day. So if you want to receive the special blessing of God that lies in the day of rest, you have to keep the Sabbath. It has never been, you know, transported to or how it trans it has never been laid on another day. It is still on the seventh day, according to the Bible. The second is he sanctifies that day. That means he set it apart. He made it a special day. And he rests. Now, why did God rest? Was God so exhausted from his work that he needed a day of rest? I mean, I think we all agree that he certainly was not. Why then is God resting? Now, we have to remember that um, Adam and Eve were created. I mean, Adam was created somewhere on Friday and Eve was created probably on Friday uh, afternoon. And the first day that they would have together would be a Sabbath. Now, they should rest on Sabbath, but how should they know how to rest on Sabbath? And so, what did Adam and Eve do? They rested with God together because God rested on the Sabbath day. So, God <clears throat> and Adam and Eve, they, they spent the Sabbath rest together. And God showed them how they could spend the Sabbath rest. And I think it was a beautiful day for them. <clears throat> he must have shown them all kinds in nature and explained to them so many things. Um, so that is what happened there. Adam and Eve's first day of rest was together with God's day of rest. I mean, Jesus says the Sabbath was made for man. So there is a relationship between man and Sabbath. And right from the beginning, it is not that the Sabbath, that the relation between man and Sabbath came in with the Jews. It was there right from the beginning. Right from the beginning. <clears throat> Five points to be made about the Sabbath. First is that the that Sabbath teaches us that God is the creator. He created everything. He, therefore, he has the authority and is worthy of being worshipped. The Sabbath is blessed and only the Sabbath is blessed. The Sabbath is sanctified and only the Sabbath is sanctified. God rested on the Sabbath. He gave an example to Adam and Eve. They rested together and so do we. The Sabbath is not a Jewish institution. When God instituted the Sabbath together with Adam and Eve rested on that day, there were, it was thousands of years away. There was no Jew at all. And the Sabbath was made for man. Communion with God. And that is basically the fascinating thing. God I mean, you know, God set Adam and Eve in the garden. And the garden was a special place on this whole planet Earth. 
But I mean, God knew, and this was the task that God gave Adam and Eve. They were to multiply and they were to spread and fill the earth, not the garden. They were to fill the earth. And so God knew one day the man, man would leave the Garden of Eden and would spread over the face of the earth. And, but man was still to be remembered that God was the creator and should not forget God because God's presence was shown in the Garden of Eden. But man would not live in the Garden of Eden. They would live thousands of kilometers away from it. But they were to be remembered. And so God said, I will not make a monument at a certain place. I will make a monument of time. And wherever man goes, he carries that monument of time with him that reminds him of me being the creator. That what's God, that's what God did. That is what the Sabbath is. And this is so genius. I mean, that's a brilliant idea. It's really brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. And that is the Sabbath. It's a monument of time remembering us that God is the creator. He is the author of everything. He has the authority and he is worthy to be worshipped and only him. The Sabbath has a sign. Ezekiel 31. Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you through all the generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Sanctification is an important thing. Restoration. The first topic that we talked about. Restoration. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. It is a sign between you and the children of Israel forever. And you find the same thing in Ezekiel um, 20, verses 12 to 20, the Sabbath assigned. So sanctification is important. We know this from Hebrews um, 12, verse 14. And the Sabbath is also, it's not just for, for reminding us that God is the creator. Sabbath is a sign that God will restore his image in us. He will sanctify us, that he will make us fit for Eden. Take an original. So we have the mark of the beast and we have the seal of God. The mark of the beast is the sign of the beast, the sign of the Antichrist, the sign of the Roman Catholic Church. The seal of God is the sign of God. And it's about loyalty and authority. And there are two questions linked to that. And that is the first is, what is the authority based upon? Based on. And the second is, what is the sign of that authority? And we know for the Roman Catholic Church that she says that she has authority on her, bestowed on her by God. That's what she says. That's what she believes. But we know from the Bible, Revelation 13 verse 2, that it says that the dragon gave this power great authority. It's the devil. It has been the devil. And that's why she could change God's law. God certainly didn't, did never give her the authority to change his law. This authority comes from the devil. What is the sign for her authority? That's what she said. It's the, 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 it's transition the right word. I don't know exactly, but this the shift from Sabbath to Sunday. On the side of God, what is the authority of God based on? It's that God is the creator, his creative power. And the sign of that creative power is the Sabbath. There is nothing in the Bible that reminds us so much and that is linked so closely to God being the creator as the Sabbath. That's simply how it is. And I mean, this is not surprising. So this link between Sabbath and the seal of God is not surprising for us because Mark of the beast is linked to keeping the commandments of God is to um, Mark and keeping the commandments of God are opposites. You probably remember that we have this slide. They are opposites and therefore the seal of God must have something to do with keeping the commandments and it is the Sabbath. It's the sign of God's authority. And the sign of the Antichrist is the sign of his authority. And that's the transition from sun, Sabbath to Sunday. When everyone has made his choice in the conflict between the worldwide statutory, statutory Sunday celebration and the God-ordained Sabbath celebration, then those who choose to walk the easy path and follow tradition will receive the mark of the beast. But those who, in spite of all danger, follow the scriptures and keep the Sabbath will receive the seal of God. That's how it is. When the time will come when this image of the beast is to be set up and everyone on this earth is brought to the choice which of the two commands to follow, the commands of man of tradition, keeping the Sunday, or the commands of God. 
and those who make the choice for the commands of man, of tradition, they will receive the mark of the beast. Those that make the choice for keeping the commandments of God, they will receive the seal of God. And may God give us the strength to, and the will to not walk the easy path. Because this easy path will lead into death. That's how Jesus says, okay, that's the narrow path and the broad path. The next topic is, and this is the last section of this presentation, because this last group that receives the seal of God is not only characterized by, having, by keeping the commandments of God, including the Sabbath, but they also have the faith of Jesus, and that is important. I want to spend some thoughts on the faith of Jesus. Three characteristics that set this group apart from the rest of Christianity and the man of the world. They keep the commandments of God, and this is mentioned twice, so this is important for the Bible. They have the testimony of Jesus, that is the spirit of prophecy, and they keep the faith of Jesus. Now, what is the faith of Jesus? The faith of Jesus is firmly based on God's word. When the, the, the devil tempted him in the desert, Jesus again and again said, it is written. He was standing on God's word and was not moved from that foundation. The faith of Jesus is a faith that can endure hunger. And that is important because we will be persecuted and we will not always have a full table available, okay? Broad and wa bread and water. That's, that's what we're going to have. But not a whole meal. The faith of Jesus won't choose the easier way. The faith of Jesus knows no compromises. Absolutely important. It's the law for the truth. The faith of Jesus looks at Jesus. Okay, Hebrews 12. This is linked with the next. The faith of Jesus, Jesus looks at the reward. That's what Hebrews 12, 1 to 3 tells us. Where has Jesus, where had Jesus the strength from to, to go through all this? Where came his strength from? And Hebrews 12 is telling us. Therefore, we also, this is after this chapter about the, the, the heroes of faith. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, these are the heroes of faith, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus began the faith in you and he will finish it if you cling to him, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What gave Jesus the strength to go through this experience of the cross and garden of Gethsemane? It was the joy that was set before him, that Jesus knew why he was doing that, that Jesus knew why he was going through all this, that he would redeem a multitude and would one day spend eternity with that multitude in heaven. That was that gave him the strength to go through all that. And that is what I mean. The faith of Jesus looks at the reward. Let us also look at the reward. That we know why we are doing this. And always are aware of the fact that what is waiting there for us is worth every effort. And we will have a talk topic where we will have a short look on this. Heaven is worth it. Every strength, every effort. The faith of Jesus is a conviction. Please, it is more than a good feeling. We are living in a time that is so emotional. Young people, they believe they are Christians because they have a good feeling on a charismatic concert and so on. They feel the Holy Spirit because they, if they are driven by the beat and by the music. They think that's the Holy Spirit. I mean, the Holy Spirit can give you good emotions. If you are in earnest prayer, all of a sudden, they can joy flow right through you. That is indescribable. Yes. But the faith of Jesus is more. It is a conviction. Because, you know, feelings, they come and they pass. They are there and they are gone. It's like the waves, up and down. But a conviction is there. It is a conviction. You know in whom you trust, in whom you believe. And the faith of Jesus can be alone. And this is for me an important one. 
can be alone because Jesus, you know, Jesus was left. He was abandoned by all and he finally felt abandoned by his father. That's why he cried out, my father, my father, why hast thou forsaken me? And what about us? Now, Jesus is our mediator. He's the high priest. Hebrews 8 was one. He's our advocate. Now, in Revelation, it tells us that at the end of time, and Paul says he's the mediator in the heavenly temple. That's where he is mediator for us. But in Revelation, it is, we are told that the temple will be filled with smoke and that no one will be able to enter. I think that's Revelation, I don't know, 15, I think. That means that the, and this is a picture um, taken from, from um, when in Moses' time, for example, the tabernacle was filled and Moses, the mediator, was not able to, to go inside. And that means that at the end time, there is a time when the temple is filled with smoke, when we will have no mediator anymore. Jesus will not be our mediator anymore. And, but this is the time when we will be sealed. So when our decision is made fixed, we are standing on Christ's side. And that means that we will have a time where we feel abandoned from Jesus. From Jesus. We are abandoned by every man, that's obvious, but we also feel abandoned by Jesus, by God. And this brings us to something interesting that is characterizing this, this group that goes through the time of tribulation, the 144,000. They sing the song of the Lamb. And we read it in Revelation 15. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. This is also called in Revelation 14, verse 3, the new song that no one could learn except the 144,000. Now, why can this group only sing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb? And the answer is because they alone go through this very same experience that Moses went through and the Lamb, Jesus, went through. What is the, the experience of Moses, the song of Moses about? It's about liberation. Okay, when God divided the sea and saved them from the enemies. What is the song of the Lamb? It's the song about tribulation. Jesus forsaken by all and he finally feels forsaken by the Father. And we, this group goes through the same experience. Tribulation, abandoned, but f despised. But finally they are liberated. They are freed when Jesus returns. They go through the very same experience. Um, Mark 8, 35. For whosoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. So the faith of Jesus, that's why I said, again, let us summarize, is a conviction. It's more than a feeling. It's a knowledge. I know in whom I believe and what I believe. It's firmly based on God's word. It can endure hunger and it won't choose the easier way. It knows no compromises. It looks at Jesus. It looks at the reward. Heaven is worth every effort. And the faith of Jesus can be alone because we will be alone. And if we are not used to be alone, if we are not used to stand alone against the multitude, against the majority, to take our stand, although all are laughing at us, are mocking us, we will have a hard time. God is willing to create this faith in us because this group has it. So this is a promise. God can create this faith in us. Let us pray for it and let us allow the Holy Spirit to create this faith in us because we need it and he will give it. That's my prayer. That's it for today. So let us make a choice to stand on God's side keeping God's commandments, that is having also the Sabbath as a day of rest, having the faith of Jesus and the Spirit 
of prophecy in our midst. God bless you.